Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Four Shots of Kaiju Kembo. Did you ever wonder if punching the douchebag that's getting in your face was maybe, just maybe, the better, safer option? Where exactly does the law draw the line between self-defense and assault? We're going to hit these topics today. I'm your host, John Hoylo, with my co-host, Angela Fered, and our special guest today, Professor Alex Bennett, and this is Four Shots of Kaiju Kembo. All right, so when is it okay to light someone up and at what point does that become assault? I'm going to be showing some clips from a conversation I had with Grandmaster Lynn Case to help us with this. Grandmaster Case is a Kaiju Kembo Grandmaster, but he's also a retired police officer in the state of Idaho who is running a police academy, the uh, Idaho State University Law Enforcement Training Program. He's going to help us with the American side. To help us with the Japanese side, we have our special guest today, Professor Alex Bennett. Say hi, Alex. How's it going, guys? Now, uh, alongside being a martial artist and writer, Alex is also a professor of Japanese history, among other things, at Kansai University in Osaka, Japan. And uh, real quick, Alex, uh, how long have you been doing what martial arts and how long have you been in Japan? Oh, well, I've been in Japan way too long is my standard answer. Um, okay. Uh, probably about, what, 32, 33 years now in total. Wow, okay. Um, originally came from New Zealand. Uh -huh. um, came here as an exchange student when I was 17. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that's when I discovered kendo. Uh -huh. And I joined the high school kendo club and pretty much got hooked on the martial arts. And uh, since then, I've continued with my kendo, but also study uh, martial arts such as naginata, uh, iaido, Ju Kendo, Tan Kendo, and some of the classical styles as well. So all of the martial arts that I do are actually weapons based, um, as opposed to you guys, where you're doing uh, uh, the sort of the unarmed or the Taijutsu side of things. I've never really been involved in Taijutsu, just just the weapons martial arts. Okay, and uh, that's uh, not a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge, not only in the arts but also in your time in Japan. And by the way, I'm really happy to have Alex here because. Not only is, does he have a, way more knowledge on Japan and Japanese culture than Angela or I ever will, he was also willing to talk to his Japanese police officer lawyer friends on today's topic. So he's going to be giving us the Japanese perspective. Uh, finally, this show will be done in the four shots format. We're going to be taking a few shots throughout the show to help mark the passage of time. Uh, feel free to drink along with us. Let us know in the comments what you're drinking. Or you can comment, let us know what you think of the rest of the show. That's always nice too. With all that set aside, let's do our first shot, and we will begin the show then. Hang on a second, Five. guys. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, there you go. <laughs> he's, he's scrambled. I usually, I'm usually the one scrambling. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the first one went into my cup of coffee, so this oh. is, this is the unadulterated version. <laughs> That's the way it works. Alrighty. All right, here we go. Salud. 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 Now, our first question is a baseline question to make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, for those of you at home, please double check anything you hear. Laws will change from country to country and state to state. So anything you hear today might not be true where you live. Please double check everything. Uh, with all that, our first question, what are the legal definitions of assault and self-defense? And when does one become the other? Let's go to Grandmaster Case in Idaho and see what he has to say first. Okay. Uh, legal definitions are pretty easy because they're in the book. So it's just a matter of looking them up and finding them. So in Idaho, and that's not true in all states, but in Idaho, we have a def uh, uh, difference between assault and battery. Uh, some states, it's the same thing. Uh, so for Idaho, basically, if I take a punch at you and I miss, that's assault. If I hit, if I make a connection, that's battery. So an assault is simply an attempted battery. But the, the, the definition reads uh, a little more in depth. It's an unlawful attempt coupled with apparent ability to commit a violent injury on the person of another or intentional unlawful threat by word or act to do violence on that person coupled with apparent ability to do so. And so once you actually create contact, it becomes battery. But the idea of even the attempt to do it allows for self-defense. Yes, absolutely. Now, they wrote, they wrote it that way specifically because you have to have all those elements in there. 
So, you know, we could joke back and forth, oh, oh that's funny, I'm going to punch you in the nose. That's not a set. Right, right, right. It has to be with, it has, I have to create that well founded fear in me. Mm -hmm. So, if we if we get an argument outside of a bar, I've clenched my fist and I say, I'm going to punch you in the nose, that probably should create that well founded fear. Now, just to summarize everything so far, because uh, this is just the basics we're at, but just to summarize, uh, two situations. So, number one, I'm walking down the street. I'm confronted by an angry neo-Nazi. He's bigger than me. He's a championship kickboxer. Uh, and he's violently threatening me and my family. Uh, and then he, I'm scared and feeling threatened. He advances on us and does one of those fake body checks. That is assault and I have the right to strike him. Is that correct? You have the right to strike him. Preemptive strikes are allowed. Okay, okay. Now the second situation real quick. Same exact thing, but it's an 87-year-old grandma who does not do kickboxing, but she's violently threatening me the same way. Let's say she's using the same words and she advances on me, maybe even puts her hand on me, but I don't feel threatened. I don't feel any kind of worry. That is not assault. And do I still have the right to punch this poor woman in the head in that case? <laughs> I don't think I'd do that. Okay, so for those of you at home, if you're interested in learning more about American law, I will be releasing the whole conversation I had with Grandmaster Case. We go into American law in much more detail. But for now, that's just the basics. Alex, how does that compare to Japan with self-defense and assault? Yeah, well, I, I first um, should mention that I am not a legal expert. And uh, what I've heard uh, from my lawyer friends and my police friends. It's, uh, it's secondhand, right? So it's not my field of expertise. But of nevertheless, um, Japanese law, there's, uh, there's a law that uh, in the penal code, Article, Article 36 1, uh, which stipulates that, well, it sort of defines what self defense is. And, and it sort of uh, goes along the lines uh, that uh, an act committed. Uh, unavoidably in defense of your or another's rights against an urgent or wrongful infringement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's Article 36 in the Penal Code. And if you break that down, um, there are certain things that have to be uh, established uh, to uh, prove that uh, the act of violence, whatever it might be, or, or to whatever degree it might be, was actually necessary. So the things that they'll look at if you get into a confrontation and you have to defend yourself, okay, after the fact, uh, first of all, the, the police or the courts will look at uh, is there or was there an illegal violation or trespass mm -hmm. against your person mm -hmm. um, or was an infringement imminent? Mm -hmm. Or uh, uh, the third point was, um, from memory, uh, was it conducted... Uh, that was the act of violence or self-defense, was it conducted to protect the rights of yourself or other people? Mm -hmm. um, uh, another point was, was there actually a need uh, for self-defense mm -hmm. and was the act unavoidable? So that sounds like that means if you could run away instead. Exactly. And so, so the point here was that even if you believe that you have committed an act of self-defense which resulted in physical contact uh with an assailant mm -hmm. an alleged assailant the fact of the matter is that if your reaction uh, later on is deemed to be excessive or did not meet those five criteria that i mentioned mm -hmm. then in fact you could be liable yourself for prosecution mm -hmm. So an act of self-defense can actually become an act of assault or battery um, if, uh, if these uh, criteria are not met. So it's a very, very strict area. And, and I might, um, if it's all right, uh, John, I, when I was being told these uh, things by my various friends, it reminded me of a situation that I got myself into in Japan. Uh-oh. Probably, shush, how many You probably shouldn't say that. It's going to go on YouTube, man. That's fine. It's all good. Uh, I, cleared it, I cleared it with the police. So it's all uh, okay. okay. <laughs> but I was um, coming home from training uh, one night when I was at university here in Kyoto. And uh, I, was, I was cycling along just actually across the road from the Nijo Castle, which is one of the main tourist uh, attractions in Kyoto City. 
And it was it was kind of late at night. I um, can't remember exactly, maybe nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. So the roads were pretty deserted, even though it's in, the, in central Kyoto. <laughs> and I, I saw somebody in front of me, uh, a male attacking a pregnant woman. And when I say attacking, beating her senseless um, with his fists. And of course, I'm cycling along. What do you do? Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't even think about this sort of thing, right? Okay. Right. I jumped off my bike and I tackled the bastard. Mm-hmm. Right? I tackled him, took, took him down to the ground, um, held him down there um, sort of in a, in a headlock until he sort of lost his will to fight. Yeah. Then the woman was standing. She was, she was crying. She was pouring you know, blood pouring from her face. Um, she was obviously very, very pregnant because her stomach was out there, like mine used to be. Um, <laughs> in the days of drinking too much beer. Before you switched to whiskey from beer, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this was at the time when uh, everybody had just started carrying around cell phones mm-hmm. in Japan. So this is about 1998, 1999, something like that. Okay. And uh, what does he do? pulls his phone out of his pocket and he says, I'm going to ring the police on you, you bastard. It's like, okay, <laughs> save me, save me. Wow. The okay. Your phone. You what happened the then? Police. Ring the police. He rang up the police and he said, I've been assaulted by a foreigner. <sighs> and within probably about 10 minutes, I wasn't going anywhere. I was just, <laughs> I was going to make sure this guy got nabbed by the police. It was just, it was just ridiculous. Right. I just yeah, stopped yeah, yeah. the crap out of this woman. Anyway, the police turn up, about 10 of them, because uh, they've got nothing else to do in Japan. Uh, they walked <laughs> up, and they took me over to one side, and they took him over to one side and heard our stories, uh, mm-hmm. independently, of course. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, you know, this is what happened. I, I stepped in to uh, stop this guy beating the crap out of this pregnant woman. Mm-hmm. And anyway, what happened in the end was um, it brought us back together. And it turns out that they were a, a married couple, uh, yeah. right? And so if she does not want to file a charge against him for violence, in this case, it's domestic violence, even though, you know, or well, not even though, but the fact it was out in public in, in right, the middle of the right. street, right. Uh, she does not want to file a complaint, then uh, he can file a complaint against me for a wow. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is unthinkable now. Yeah. Six months later, Japan actually introduced a domestic violence law, which prevents right. that kind of thing. But at that time, believe it or not, there was not a domestic violence law in Japan. I got a and, story for you after you're done here that happened about four years ago. All right. <laughs> we'll we'll that. Um, and so anyway, uh, the, 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 the cop in charge, he says, right, so this is the deal. Um, so basically, you're, you're in the wrong here. And I said, how the can I be in the wrong here when look at this woman for crying out loud? It's obviously that it's obvious. I might have even saved the baby's life. Mm -hmm. Um, Might have saved her life. What are you talking about? Clearly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. blood everywhere. Mm -hmm. She's been beaten, you know, to a pulp. What the are you talking about? And so the reason, the reason being what I just said, there are a couple, she doesn't, if she doesn't want to file charges, therefore I'm liable. And so, so the way they settled it was, you have to say sorry. <laughs> I, I kid you not. I kid you not. You have to say sorry, he said to me. And I said, the fuck I'm saying sorry. You might have to bleep that out. The fuck I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what the, f- what are you talking about? And he said, well, if you don't say sorry, we're going to arrest you. And so in, instead of talking, that's when I switched to English mm-hmm. and and I basically said, I'm sorry <laughs> so that everybody could hear that, that I even saw your fucking ugly face. And I said, again, I'll rip your head off and shit down the hole. Respond. They didn't understand that bit. They no. the sorry bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt, I felt that, uh, um, you know, I felt so pissed off with Japan. Yeah, for good so reason. Angry that I'm the one in the wrong here. But, for good reason, yeah. But... I, the cops gave me a way out by saying sorry, um, and I, mm-hmm. I used that, uh, you know, in the cheekiest uh, New Zealand way that I could think <laughs> of and, and got away with swearing in, in front of the police um, with abandon. So, yeah, that's nice. uh, 
Yeah, so it's, it, it's a, you know, the point, the, the, what it woke me up to, put it yeah. this way, uh, John, is like in Japan, any use of violence in any situation uh, is perilous. Uh, yeah. Whether you're in the right or you're in the wrong, yeah. Okay. Uh, you are treading a very, uh, well, treading on thin ice, put it that way. And, now, I have um, a question for you about that. Yeah. Real quick, though, Angelo, what was your story? What's going on there? So it didn't happen to me. I'll say that mm-hmm. right now. But I had a similar question, and, and a friend of mine who does Kukushin Karate told me a very similar story to what you just said. Mm-hmm. Four guys beating the shit out of a woman, and it ended up being one of the guy's wives. Same situation. He came in, and he does Kukushin Karate, so there was no tackling. It was four on one. He knocked the four guys out. The cops show up. She doesn't want to press charges. Same thing. And then so he got scared and he left. <laughs> so he's like, oh, fuck this. And no, no, wait, no, he didn't get scared and left. He got, I think he ended up getting, putting in holding. And they told him the same thing. Like, if you apologize, we'll let you go. And then um, on top of the fact that happened, somehow his employers got dragged in. And and then he had to go with his employers and his boss, apologize to the company, to his company, mm-hmm. go back over there, give them a gift. And then the guy said, if you ever want to come over and drink with me sometime. And he was he had to go through the whole thing. Yes, and he similar, told me very, similar experience. very similar. Yeah. But he had to actually go an extra mile because his boss made him buy the guy a gift and give the guy a gift and apologize formal Japanese style for him no. and his wife. And this was no. about, this was about, I heard this story about four years back and maybe this happened to that guy about maybe, f- maybe five years before that. So this is probably like 10 years ago. I don't know how, where Japanese law is now on that, but I can tie that story to what my in-laws told me when I first came to Japan. They're like, whatever you do, we know you're a fighter. Never fight anyone. Just run away. Mm-hmm. Just run away. You'll lose your visa. You just run away. Yeah. Alex, do you know when the domestic violence laws changed? I know it was pretty recently. That when did you say it was? Well, this this happened to me. It was in the late nineties, uh-huh. um, and I remember. I'm not sure the exact year, but I remember six months later, uh, I was reading in Japan Times that Japan had just uh, um, initiated a, a law on domestic violence. And okay, like, so that was around then. You mean okay. there wasn't a law before this? <laughs> so, so no. But here's here's the old deal. Just kind of tying in what you just said. This happened after that law was passed, right. and that shit is still happening. So if you're in Japan yeah. and you end up in that kind of a situation, um, my strongest recommendation in the modern age, open your phone, start recording, and start telling them, I'm recording you, I'm recording you, I just called the police, I'm recording you, and that is the best way to get anything to stop. Because then if they come and attack you and you're holding the phone, yeah. then now they attacked you, now you have video. Because that's the other thing you talked about, that vague description of, uh, all, there's a lot of ifs, ands, or and statements, mm-hmm. right? But at the end, in court, what always holds up is evidence. Yes. So the second something like this starts, you want as much evidence from the very beginning to the very end in mm-hmm. your favor so that if then it's no longer hearsay. Now you have right. video footage of what's happening. Now, we're going to talk about this evidence again pretty soon, but one question for you, Alex, real fast. Uh, when we first talked about the laws in Japan, you mentioned it was confusing and... To me, that sounds very Japanese. It sounds, I mean, everything we're talking about right now, they don't want people to fight. They don't want to interrupt anything else. It's like they want no fighting at all. Is there a reason for that in the, in the culture, in the history, that, that the government is so intent on keeping anybody from fighting, even in these situations we're talking about? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, uh, as you rightly point out, John, there is a historical precedent for this kind of thing. And it goes way back uh, into the 16th century, in Mm. fact, uh, with the creation of what they call kenka ryose by rules or laws. And uh, this basically means that anybody involved in a fight, uh, regardless of um, whether it's, you know, you're provoked um, and you're in the right and the other person's in the wrong, both people will be punished. And actually, when I was doing a bit of preparation for this, I, I dug out one of my lectures to my students. Can I share screen? Um, so, for example, um, you guys uh, seeing the screen? Now we are, yeah. Now we are, yes. Okay. So this is uh, from what is known as the Imagawa Kanamokuroku. Imagawa was one of the clans um, mm-hmm. in the Warring States period. And the, the fox sentenced to death. 
<laughs> yep, it gets pretty serious. So, what what they, the the reason why is because when you're talking about uh, warrior society or samurai society, if one person gets into a fight, mm-hmm. uh, then relatives are going to look for revenge, and mm-hmm. relatives of the other party are going to look for revenge after the revenge, and it's going to mm-hmm. escalate. And an all very already very precarious situation is going to mm. perhaps uh, explode into something that uh, really um, nobody wants. And so right. at, at the time, there were actually quite a few clans that put out these uh, Kenka Dyorse by laws. And I'll just read this out to you. Um, it's a translation from the Imagawa Kanamokuroku. Uh, okay. In dealing with those who have quarreled, both parties should be sentenced to death irrespective of who is in the right or in the wrong. Ah. I, I love what follows. This is, is uh, in cases where one party to the dispute, although provoked and attacked, controls himself, makes no defense, and as a result is wounded slash probably killed, his appeal <laughs> should be granted. <laughs> While it is reprehensible that he should have been a party to the dispute and perhaps contributed to its outbreak, his respect for the law and not returning the attack uh. consideration. Um, but what's interesting about that, um, I'll just uh, share another page. Can you see the bushy response? Yes. Okay, so this is a, a, a samurai from the Takeda clan. Okay. Uh, and, and Takeda Shingen also uh, created such a, a, a law. And his, his warriors under him said, well, come on, Shingen. This makes us, uh, puts us in a very difficult situation. And so for one, one of his generals, a guy called Naito Shuri, mm-hmm. he wrote this letter uh, to Shingen. In order to prevent quarrels, the rule of Kenka Ryoseibai makes sense to me. However, those who remain patient while being insulted cannot be useful samurai for the Lord. Mm-hmm. If we condone such behavior, the samurai will all become flabby and soft. If the order of the Lord encourages patience, it will be safe and orderly for everyone, but the end result will be a great loss to our Lord. Hmm. If safety is the samurai's only reason for obeying laws, they will become they will stray from the way of manliness. They will, <laughs> they will all become <laughs> useless cowards. So there was there was quite a balancing act going on there. So hey, yeah, yeah. his honor uh, or himself insulted or is attacked in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, then the law said that mm, you must deal with it and not react. Uh, right. If anything, you should run away. Huh, and that's, that's the way it is now today. Talking about. But in terms of being a manly samurai who's, you know, who's always on the edge, uh, uh, always ready to fight uh, yeah. to the death for the Lord. Right. Well, this is kind of contradicting their purpose in life. So you mm-hmm. can see this. Well, Naito, Naito pretty much pre-predicted uh, the whole effect of uh j-pop on 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 japanese society now <laughs> <laughs> all right well, we're gonna move on to this one thing before we do the uh, next thing <laughs> let's get on j-pop um i have a this is, well now it is time for a true false question this is a pop quiz for the both of you guys this is a true false question worth 100 points alex you get to answer first Angelo gets the home field advantage. In America, in American law, in a tense situation leading up to a fight, true or false, trying to make the other person flinch can be considered assault. Well, based on uh, your Shihan's uh, video just before, yes. Uh huh. Okay. Based on that, do you think that's the case in America now? Now. Well, America is one of those enigmas of the world. Nobody knows what the hell is going on in America. Now. <laughs> I don't know what's going on either. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I was surprised to see that, uh, well, to hear that assault is the attempt <clears throat> to strike somebody and battery is actually making contact so a flinch or a faint i, I assume it's something something like that yeah, um, yeah that is the start of assault uh and it might provoke the other person to react so yes i would say it is okay she's saying true angela what do you say true or false 
we were just saying state by state, right? State by state, but generally speaking, it, that it, it can be considered assault. To make someone flinch. Not actually trying to hit them, just making them flinch. Not trying to hit them, just making them flinch. Hmm. I'm going to go on the safe side and knowing where, where things are at right now in the climate and say false. False. Okay. The answer is true. It Yay. can be considered assault. 100 points for Alex. Sorry, Angela. We'll make it up for the next one. Uh, oh. <laughs> but I was surprised too when I learned this. Uh, if somebody is threatening you and you are fearing for your life, you're fearing for your safety, and they try to make you think you're, they're going to hit you, you do have the right to strike them. Uh, it, as, pre, as we heard in the video, preemptive strikes are allowed, and it is considered, a, by law, it can be considered assault. Of course, in the court, you need to prove that you were scared, that you were actually afraid of them hurting you. There's a whole bunch of other things you need to prove in court, but it can be considered assault case by case. Now, as we talk about this, this flinch mechanic, before we do our next shot and our next topic, uh, I want to ask you both your predictions on a particular bar fight case that's happening here in America. Uh, this is a case that I thought was going to be open and shut. And then I learned that making someone flinch can be considered assault. So buckle up for a second. This is story time. I'm going to tell you guys the tale of Joe Schilling. For those of you who don't know, Schilling is a kickboxer in America. He has a record. He's got a big Muay Thai record, MMA, boxing. Soon he might have a criminal record. He's being sued for punching a douchebag in a bar who was being a douchebag in a bar. Now, I might be biased. I don't want to uh, keep calling this guy a douchebag, so I have a handy list of synonyms to help me, if you guys will bear with me. Um, I'll put a link to the video in the description, but here's the story for now. What we know so far, uh, Joe Schilling and this twat are hanging out at the same bar. Uh, Rumor has it, they don't like each other, they're eyeballing each other, and, you know, the whole night they don't like each other, the fight's probably going to best out. So, rumor has it, the staff does not like this prick. Um, he's, uh, rumor has it, he's on Molly, he's, and rumor has it, he was saying some things about shilling significant other. What we have on film, Jackass is hanging out between the tables, uh, dancing between the tables, blocking staff from doing their stuff, rapping over the music, generally being obnoxious. Oh, and apparently the staff really doesn't like him. Um, and he's doing all this stuff. Now, Schilling walks up from behind because he needs to walk past. Moron doesn't see him as he's smiling, dancing, moving around. We have a little hi to Anna over there. Okay, she's sleeping. So Moron doesn't see him. Oh, she's high over there, okay. <laughs> so as i was saying, moron doesn't see him he's dancing and he bumps into shilling smiling the whole time drunky mick drunk drunk apologizes right away because he doesn't know who it is shilling on the video seems to say okay and walks past then dingleberry realizes who he ran into and you see the smile disappear from his face. And he calls out to Schilling. Schilling turns around. The two are now face to face. Douche Canoe decides that this is the time to try and make Schilling flinch. He leans in for one of those fake body checks. He says he was leaning in to hear what Schilling was going to say. I call bullshit. You can watch the video. But unfortunately for him, Schilling's flinch response is to punch you in the face, which he does very well. The guy goes down. He is now suing Joe Schilling and the bar. Now, three things before you give me your predictions. These are all uh, very important for the case. Number one, Schilling is a head taller than this twat waffle and is a professional fighter. Number two, uh, Schilling has gone on record saying that he was fearing for his life, which is bullshit. But he has to say that so that hopes that the courts will think he did made a reasonable course of action. Number three, this tosser now has a history of suing establishments after starting a fight. This is his second time doing that. Last time he made a bunch of money at an out-of-court settlement. 
all of that in mind, again, we're not lawyers, but what is your prediction based on what you know in America? Will Schilling win this case? Well, O.J. Simpson won his case, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> so, the first one anyway, yes. <laughs> yeah, so really, um, when we talk about the American legal system, you know, my understanding of it, through television dramas, of course. Of course. Is, yeah. <laughs> it really depends how much money you've got and how good your lawyers are. Yes. Whether you win the case or not. And mm -hmm. uh, in this case, well, the fact, it's interesting, you know, because it, it, in Japan, there's also a very uh, important point of, well, self-defense or anything like this is like um, uh, whether, how much of a mismatch it is and how much, uh, excessive force was used in uh, in the intent, if you like, of self defense. If it's excessive, mm -hmm. then actually you are liable. Right, right. So this this affects people who are martial artists as well, mm -hmm. um, because if you come up against, uh, say, you're a I don't know a, a, a high graded say kyokushin or judoka or or whatever, and You've got somebody who's very small, uh, maybe, uh, let's just say, considerably smaller in size than you. Yeah. Uh, maybe even considerably older than you and nowhere near as, uh, as uh, physically threatening or, mm -hmm. um, or strong or fast. Mm -hmm. And even though you are provoked, if you, if you react in what you call self-defense, clearly there is a mismatch. Right. In which case... Uh, there's a very high possibility that the law will not look in your favor, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the Japanese context. Right. Um, now, with, this, with the states, uh, again, I mean, this, is, this falls way out of my purview of, of, of expertise, mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems to me it just depends on how well it's argued. I agree with that. It is, it is definitely going to come up to what happens in the courts. Angela, what are your thoughts? What's your prediction? What state is this in? Florida. Ah, oh, okay, Florida. He might be, he actually might be okay. Yeah. Why do you yeah. say that? They have their stand your ground laws, so you can essentially that's this is why people got so mad. I'm not even going to mention this case because I don't want this to get. There was a previous case very similar, and the guy shot somebody. And this happens all the time in Florida. So before we, I'm not even going to go to the specifics of the cases and the people that get shot, but this happens all the time in Florida. Mm -hmm. Someone, so it's called the stand your ground law. You can literally just pull out your gun and shoot someone because you felt they were threatened. They were threatening you, and if you kill them, even better. If you don't, well, then you end up in the case that your buddy's in. You didn't kill him, or not your buddy, but the guy you mentioned is in, where you have to explain why you did it. And right. Florida tends to favor stand your ground laws. They tend mm -hmm. to favor the per the the person who's saying I stood my ground. Mm -hmm. And um, also, Florida is a very conservative state. So the fact that the uh, ass the assailant Mm -hmm. It does. It is concerning that his lawyer has won him a lot of cases in the past for mm -hmm. suing the franchise. But in this case, he's suing the guy individually. Mm -hmm. And in this case, he might always get a rebound to try to sue the establishment later. Well, um, he, he is suing the establishment also. Both. Okay. Okay. All right. So I predict that he may win the establishment one. Mm -hmm. But as far as the criminal charges against that guy, mm -hmm. um, most likely Florida is going to back up and say it's okay because okay. of the stand your ground laws. And because he was also on an illegal drug. If there's any evidence that he was on an illegal drug, Florida really does not like that kind of stuff. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard our predictions. We are total amateurs. We have no idea what's going to happen. But stay tuned to find out what happens in that case. In the meantime, we're going to take our next shot. So if you guys are ready, we're going to move on to our next topic, which is knives. We all like knives. <laughs> Cheers. The knives. Cheers. Knives. Cheers. Now, we live in a knife, gun, and stick world. If you're attacked by someone with a weapon, it will probably be one of those three. Now, the three of us here, we're all in Japan. So today, we're not going to talk too much about guns. Uh, Angelo, Alex, do you have any fear? of gun violence living here in Japan? No. Absolutely none. Why not? Because nobody's got guns. <laughs> yeah. 
Only because uh, because there's no NRA in the in, in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only the only people with guns, but mostly it's a buckshot. They're all hunters, mm-hmm. and so the, the reason they own a gun is not for self defense. It's yeah. just for hunting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I like that as well. Go ahead, Alex. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, in addition to that, uh, the laws surrounding gun and gun ownership are so stringent mm-hmm. in Japan. Yes. Um, that uh, you know, it's common knowledge that people in the underworld uh own uh firearms mm-hmm. um, carry mm-hmm. them around but you, the average person in japan has probably never seen a gun other than those that are holstered on the side of a policeman right um and uh you know uh, to even have held a gun or shot a gun is is i can put count on and the number of japanese people i know up from police who have done that uh, and you mentioned like how strict the laws are just for uh, some people in America who might want to know, because there are people who hold guns for self-defense, you know, they carry their own guns. As Alex said, it's really hard to get a, a gun license. The law, it is a bunch of things you need to follow. Once you get a gun license, there is no open carry. There is no concealed carry. I mean, just, just put that in your head, what that means. And then also, as Alex said, with the, the underground, uh, the Yakuza, would you guys both agree that most, if not all, gun violence in Japan is done by Yakuza to Yakuza? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. It, it's literally, if you don't actually join the Yakuza, they'll, they'll hurt you in other ways if you really mess them up. But I mean, they're even then they kind of stay away from that. Yeah. Another point uh, worthy of mention also is uh, that the guns that are legal in Japan, uh, as long as you're a registered hunter, mm-hmm. um, you're not allowed semi-automatics. You're not allowed military grade uh, weapons of any kind. Uh, you're not allowed handguns either. So it's generally just uh, buckshot shotguns, right? Yeah. And you mentioned the Yakuza. I, I've, I remember hearing a rumor somewhere. There was a couple of news articles talking about how even the Yakuza might be having a harder time getting guns in the country now. Um, now, this is all hearsay, whatever. But anyway, we're not going to talk any more about guns. This is why. We're going to talk more about knives because knives are a thing here. Now, a while back, I worked at a small time newspaper, you know, part time. My limited experience there, when I look at the news here, I really get the feeling that the writers of these stories are being told by the editors. Don't put too many details because people don't care. I really get the feeling we talk about how safe Japan is and how people don't you know, want to fight in the first place because of the law. I really get the feeling people are not interested in these stories. But as Angelo has pointed out before, I I put out a lot of links on the internet of the knife stabbings and things that happen. I would say they happen a lot. You, They're not really the big main story. I would say every three weeks, you'll get one to three stabbings somewhere in there, uh, if you really know where to look. So there have been some other knife cases. One of the big ones was, I don't know if you guys heard about it, in Aichi Prefecture, there was a 14-year-old kid. Uh, he stabbed a classmate over bullying. Uh, on Halloween night, we had a guy dressed as the Joker light a train car on fire and cut up 17 people. Uh, and apparently that was a copycat case. Apparently he was copying someone else. So I want to talk about knives. Uh, there are some kaiju couple people who love knives. Let's go back to America and hear from Grandmaster Case. And then we'll come back to Alex and see how they compare. I know about in America, how do knives affect the definitions of assault and battery and the, the, the penalties you get for it as well? So now we have to move into a variation of the two codes that we just talked about, assault and battery. We use an aggravated assault and aggravated battery, which would include um, a weapon or Mm -hmm. a caustic chemical or something like that, that where there's a serious danger of creating serious bodily harm Mm -hmm. or death. So if you come at me with a knife, now that's aggravated assault. Unless you get me, that's aggravated battery. Um, And the penalties are much, much stricter. so adding a weapon to the mix makes it much more much more serious. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Mm-hmm. It just means that the situation has to be right. Okay. And I mean, how does the self defense aspect of that work? When is it okay to use a weapon as a self defense as opposed to an assault? Okay. So you got to keep in mind that you're now introducing deadly force, mm-hmm. and the situation has to warrant that. So if if we get in a fist fight. And we're pretty evenly matched. I get in a fist fight and then I pull a knife. Hey, that's my bad because the situation didn't warrant that. Mm-hmm. Now you get your uh, your six foot eight neo Nazi kickboxing champion that comes after the little old lady. Mm-hmm. 
she could probably pull the knife and get away with it because it's really super dangerous for her. True, it's an unarmed combat, but he's going to break it. So she has the right to pull a weapon in that case. Okay. Now, what is the legal size limit of a knife you can carry? It varies from place to place. Mm -hmm. Idaho doesn't care. It doesn't care, really. It doesn't care, concealed, fully exposed, doesn't matter. Wow. As long as you're 18 and meet the qualifications to get a concealed license if you need one, uh -huh. such as you can't be a convicted felon, you can't be convicted of a domestic violence. There's a few other things. Okay. Uh, assuming none of those are in play and you're 18 or over, carry what you want. Really? So honestly, I was really shocked learning that in Idaho, you can carry a knife of any size. In California, I think it's three inches. Do you know, Angela, with the it's knife three, size? It's like, it's like three inches, yeah. I mean, it's like, like I used to carry a folder, you know, about that big legally, and it was okay to carry. Uh, Alex, how does all this compare to Japan with knives? Well, Japan with knives is uh, it's kind of interesting. The, the law is, is constantly changing. Um, the law regarding blades... Um, of all kinds, uh, re regardless of size and, and type, whether they be the single katana or a, or a you know a knife like like this, for example, or a hunting knife or a kitchen knife or whatever, um, they're actually uh, controlled in Japan uh, through the what they call the Swords and Firearms Possession Control Law, um, which was first created in 1958, uh, but mm -hmm. it's been constantly amended. Um, uh, 1993, 1990, uh, 1995, 2008, and most recently, from memory, I think it was amended again in 2018. Mm -hmm. And that was following uh, a knife assault on a Shinkansen, on a bullet train. Hmm. Um, you might remember that um, it was uh, it was on in June in uh, 2018. There was a guy traveling on a on, on a bullet train between Shin Yokohama and Odawara. Okay, and he basically killed somebody. Just somebody randomly sitting on the Shinkansen, just randomly killed them with a knife and and seriously injured two more people. Now, before we go on, I just want to say that, like I mentioned before, the, this happens a lot. That I mean, Japan is one of the safest countries I think ever. But these crimes don't just magically disappear oh, when you but, cross but the wait borders. Wait a second. So, are, are you going to later? Are you going to talk about other topics, or, or like in Japan, or is it? Are we sticking to knives? But I just want to. I'm asking because there's an article that I read that's not knife related, but it is uh, assault. It's. Mm, I would classify this as a domestic terrorist attack. If I had hmm. to, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's let Alex finish, and you can go ahead and add it in. I'll. Edit whatever we need to do. Yeah, well, well, basically, after this 2018 thing, uh, it, was, it was only a matter of weeks that the Japanese government they basically banned the possession of uh, unpacked knives. Unpacked uh, knives, okay. Yeah, on on trains as a part of a new measure. Um, you know, and the Japanese knife laws are always uh, evolving as it stands at the moment. What do you mean an impact knife? Well, one that's not in a case or not in a box that's been bought from a shop oh, okay. mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you might go shopping in a supermarket and buy a kitchen knife. Well, you've got to get it home, don't you? So you're going to go on a train with a knife, but that knife has to be packed and it, and it can't be in an, uh, you know, it can't be out of its box or it can't have been taken out of its box. Um, so if you're just carrying a knife, say in your belt or in your pocket or, or, or in your bag, and essentially, you're in you're in big trouble now. The way that uh, uh, um, the Firearms Act or the the Blade Firearms Act says that that no person is allowed to carry a knife with a blade longer than six centimeters at all, unless it's been approved uh, by a, a cabinet office ordinance. Um, and is something that you are you that you use for your business mm -hmm. or other justifiable re, uh, justifiable reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so you might be a, a chef, or you might be I don't know. You might be somebody. You might be a might be a carpenter carrying around a cutter knife or something like that. Okay. Um, so you actually have a reason for it, but uh, it must be uh, put in your bag. And somewhere that cannot be accessed with ease, mm -hmm. so you can't carry it on your belt or something like that. Right. What um, happens if you do? 
uh, well, you, you're you're going to get in, in in big trouble. Um, so basically, owning owning a knife that has a that has a fixed blade longer than 15 centimeters. So you might you know, again, if you're a if you're a chef or something like that, if you own a, a knife or a blade, a fixed blade of more than 15 centimeters, you've got to have permission uh, mm. from the uh, Prefectural Public Safety Commission. Uh, but that's only for home ownership. Okay. So that means you're not allowed to carry it around with you willy-nilly. Mm. It's mm. got to be truly packaged up. Mm. And pocket blades. Uh, so, for example, I've got a Swiss Army knife that I take with me when I go try um, hiking and so on. Um, they're legal to carry around as long as the blade is shorter than six centimeters. Six centimeters. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, it can't be in a visible place somewhere that's easily accessed. It's got to be locked away in your bag. Um, and anything longer than that, you've got to get uh, permission. Um, so unless uh, that blade on, on a pocket knife or something like that is in, is in excess of eight centimeters, in which case it's banned outright as it, as it is now. So um, basically... Uh, you know, you're going to have knives for if you're a hunter or you're a fisherman or you're a chef or something like that. Um, this the possession of uh, um, such a blade if you're if you're tra if you're on public transport and it's uh, somewhere that can be accessed accessed easily mm -hmm. uh, is going to get you in a lot of trouble, possibly even land you in jail. So. One thing about Kaju Kembo is uh, we have a lot of eskrima in our art as well. Not, a, not everyone carries knives, but there are some knife nuts. Uh, I, I like knives too. Uh, a lot of Kaju Kembo guys make sure their daughters carry knives, et cetera, et cetera. So you said the limit is six centimeters, right? But legally, yeah. but legally on the, according to the word. Yeah. Now, if a Kaju Kembo guy comes to Japan and wants to carry a legally sized knife, what's your advice? Well, my advice is don't. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, quite simply, but um, you know, you will you will get in trouble. Right. Uh, there was a story that was uh, I remember reading it in the Japan Times. Uh, uh -huh. It was quite famous. It was about uh, it was an American tourist. Mm -hmm. It was a seventy year old, a seventy four year old American tourist who came to Japan, and he stepped into a police station. Right, you know, one of the korban. Yeah. Uh, to get directions to go somewhere, as you do, you go to the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. how do I get to such and such, I don't know, station or whatever. And it turns out that he had a pocket knife on him. I think it was just a Swiss army knife or something like that. Um, I don't know how it got to that conversation, but apparently mm -hmm. the police asked him, you're not carrying a weapon or anything, are you? And he said, oh, yeah, well, I've got a pocket knife. And he, he produced the pocket knife that the, the cops measured it and found that the blade exceeded the blade length by something like one centimeter and he was immediately arrested and he was detained uh in police custody for nine days wow. in the end he got off it was okay of course um, you know sent on his way tail between his legs yeah um, but if you're carrying any blade in japan uh without a proper reason there's no reason for a tourist to carry a pocket knife around there. There's no okay. reason for a, a kaju kempo uh, guy to to come to Japan with a with a blade. Okay. Um, so immediately, if, if if you get found with it, mm -hmm. uh, you you leave yourself open for some very serious legal uh, difficulties. That's and that, that that sort of uh, relates to whether you can use a blade in self defense as well, mm -hmm. um, because all of the things I talked about, what is legal or justifiable self defense. Uh, somebody attacks you, you fight them off with a blade. Uh, well, first of all, that's excessive because if the person's attacking you with bare hands and you're using a blade, then that makes uh, right. actually your self-defense uh, aggravated assault or battery or something worse, maybe even attempted murder, who knows? Right. Um, because in theory, in the first place, there is no reason for you to have a knife. Right. So you shouldn't have one. Therefore, you shouldn't have been able to use one for self-defense. Hmm. It was a really interesting case about some old man. Mm -hmm. uh, he was quite old, got into a, a, a fight with some a young guy. He's about 39 years old. The old man was way older. Uh, he was mm -hmm. in his 70s, I believe. Yeah. And the young guy started making threatening gestures to him. You're, you want me to, you want, you want some, mate? You want some? Okay. And the old guy got scared. He grabbed 
a kitchen knife out of his car, okay, which just happened to be in his car for some reason, and he used that for self-defense. Mm -hmm. Went to court. It turns out the old geezer was in the wrong because uh, he was using a knife in a fist fight. So he lost the case. It went to a, to a higher court. Eventually, it went through three court, uh, court rulings. And eventually, huh. it worked out that were actually, because the young guy was so much stronger and so much more physical and threatening to start with, uh, to make up that imbalance in strength, the old geezer using the knife was possibly justifiable. Huh, so they didn't reach that point then? Yeah, it, it had to go that far. Yeah, the, the fact that it had to go that far, that sounds very Japanese yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But so um, what uh, Angela was talking about before with the uh, stand your ground uh, yeah. um, law in Florida, uh -huh. there is absolutely no concept of that in Japan right. whatsoever. Oh, yeah, right, no, not at all, I imagine. California, for that matter. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, you mentioned another story. There's, there's a, there's a very... That is a very Florida thing. <laughs> Florida, Florida, a weird place. Again. Florida, Florida might not actually. I, I don't know. Florida is almost not America. It's its own <laughs> country. It really is. <laughs> they got more meth than. Uh, I'm not going to go that way. Anyway, ah, you ah, mentioned ah, something about, uh, and about hookers, another anyway. domestic <laughs> terrorist case. What were you talking about? Right. Oh, so I, I mean, I would consider this a domestic care. I'll tell you the case and you tell me if it's domestic terror terrorism. Okay. Or um osaka 24 people died and three others were feared dead after a suspected arson attack um a guy walked into a building poured a poured a tank of gas and lit it on fire mm -hmm. um fire officials said that the 27 people uh 17 males and 10 males died so he mm -hmm. killed about 24 27 people mm -hmm. what his motives were I guess that's what threats or terrorism becomes weird, right? Because if it's terrorism, it has to, there has to be some sort of political motive. And if it's not, it's just considered a, I don't know. I'll leave that up to you guys. Okay. I, my thought is that, uh, oh, actually, actually, Alex, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's just, um, I was going to say, I mean, when people think of uh, domestic terrorism in Japan, the uh, first time I heard that word being used a lot in Japan was in 1994 with the uh, Omu Shinrikyo. The pipe bombs, um, right? Sarin gas uh, attacks on the subways in Tokyo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and since then, you, you'll you see around Japanese train stations, won't you? Uh, heightened alert for uh, uh, on the lookout for terrorism. Right. Okay. And when, we, when most people think of terrorism, they think of uh, uh, outside influences, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe uh, religious terrorism or political terrorism from a from a different country or a different ethnic group or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, actually, when when you see the word terrorism in Japan, uh, indeed, uh, the domestic terrorism, be it the Omushinikyo or the the tragic uh, events last Friday in Osaka and uh, a year oh, yeah. or so ago in, in Kyoto, also the uh, uh, animation Kyoto animation. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah was uh, set on fire by an arsonist um, and scores of people were killed in that as well. Right. Um, terrorism, again, it, it's, uh, there are many different definitions for terrorism. Um, mm. What is the motive? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a political motive or, a, or some other kind of motive to terrorize a population. So the, the, the idea of terrorism is, um, if you actually try and define it, there are many different definitions. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just look at the Oxford language, right? It's the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians. And this is why I said earlier, it has to do with in the pursuit of political aims, according to the Oxford Dictionary. Yeah. So that, that's why I said earlier, like, it may actually not be considered domestic terrorism unless, because we don't know yet what mm -hmm. the motive behind this was. Right. Once we know what the guy's motives were, if there's any type of political anything, if he's or, or religious, a, or right. religious, right. if he's yeah. trying to make any type of social statement with his act, then yes, it would be considered domestic terrorism. Yeah. Yeah, right my now, understanding of terrorism is always that it's based on terror, that they're trying to give fear to the public. Yeah. yeah. For, for a political right. purpose or exactly. a religious purpose or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. So there's yeah. got to be a mo it's got to be another motive apart from just giving. Uh, just causing. killing people right, right. <laughs> alright so before we go on to our next shot it is time for our next pop quiz true or false question I fucking suck at these yeah you do it right so far <laughs> <laughs> so this time Angela you get to go first I don't know if that helps <laughs> <laughs> true or false 
In Japanese history, a Japanese prime minister has been stabbed on live television by someone with a traditional Japanese blade. Angelo, true or false? True. True. Okay. Alex, what do you say? I have, a, I have an image in my head of that. I can't remember who or why, but I'm going to go true as well. Okay. I saw a video. I saw a video. The answer is <laughs> false. Oh, what? But, but I saw a video. <laughs> oh, unless, you cha- but, unless, you, unless, you, unless it wasn't a traditional Japanese blade. He was not a prime minister. That's the thing. Ah, uh, see. Uh, sorry, see, guys. Took you both. Yeah, um, see, that one was in relation to Ormu. Like that. Was that the Ormu? Uh, Ormu Shiniko, the one of the leaders, was stabbed on television afterwards, wasn't he? No, that one I'm not sure about. Uh, the one I'm keeping in mind is in 1960, the head of the Japanese Socialist Party ah. yeah, yeah, was stabbed on live TV by a 17-year-old Japanese nationalist. Uh, the socialist chairman was named Inejiro Asanuma. Uh, the nationalist 17-year-old kid was Otoya Yamaguchi. Uh, he rushed onto the stage and stabbed this socialist chairman with a wakizashi. Uh, and then uh, this young kid was incarcerated and later committed suicide in the prison. Uh, real quick, Alex, what yeah. is the wakiz- wakizashi? I-, I know that the, the, the kanto is the smallest blade. What is the wakizashi exactly? Wakizashi is uh, it's like a samurai would traditionally have two uh, s- swords at his side. Mm-hmm. And one was his long sword and the other one was his short sword. So mm-hmm. wakizashi is a short sword. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's, it's still about it depends. Thing, right? There's various sizes. It's about half yeah, the size. The tanto's is. about here, right? So yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Still, yeah. Tanto's more like a, a single-edged dagger. But uh, yeah. um, uh, wakizashi is, uh, is a short sword. Uh, you fucking stabbed him with a sword, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, so that's another part of your, that's another false part of your fucking question right there. It wasn't a knife. <laughs> yeah, true. A traditional oh, Japanese see, I thought, blade. I thought that's where you were going with the trick. A traditional the Japanese blade. Uh, <laughs> ah, there you go. Actually, um, the, the thing I was talking about, um, I just did a quick search on the internet just now. Go for it. Actually, in, in 1995, um, Murai. A guy called Murai Hideo, I think it was. He was he was the um, one of the leaders of the Ormu Shiniko religious cult. Oh, and uh, he was actually stabbed with a kitchen knife <clears throat> on the street in front of a whole lot of uh, uh, television cameras. So, oh wow, yeah. So there is uh, it seems to be a bit of history of people getting stabbed on television in Japan. <laughs> and again, like I said before, Japan is, is seriously one of the safest countries in the world for many reasons. But these crimes still do exist. I know there was another story. I don't remember when it was, but there was the the sh- head of a Shinto shrine was stabbed. There was some kind of argument over the progression of leadership, and they got stabbed by a katana as well. Th- these things do happen. Anyway, with all of that set aside, we're going to do our next shot and move on to our next topic, which is castle law. So when you guys are ready, castle law, by the way, if you're not from America, is uh, you might have not heard of it. Uh, because it is the name of an American self-defense law. So we're going to take our shot first, and then we're going to go to Grandmaster Case and let him explain it, because he'll do better than I do. Let's do our shot first. Exactly is Castle Law. So uh, in Idaho, that Castle Law is the standard ground. It's all basically the same thing. Um, But there is a special section in there for dwellings or businesses a place where you're enclosed. Mm-hmm. Um, so now let's just go to that here real quick. For you. Sure. Defense of others. Let's see. A person, a person using force or deadly force in defense of a, of a habitation, place of business or employment or occupied vehicle uh, is presumed to have acted reasonably and had a reasonable fear of him in a peril of death or serious bodily injury. Uh, if entry was made or attempted in a violent manner, like if I just knock on the door and open it, hey, you can't shoot me. Um, but if I kick the door in, my bad, you're going to own me. Uh, that, and remember, this is Idaho. It's different in other places. Now, in America, it seems like, at least the image is, if you break into someone's home, all bets are off. I mean, it kind of brings to mind the old signs of trespassers will be shot on sight. Yeah. What exactly are the um, limits of this? Well, uh, if they, the castle doctrine or the, that part that I just read to you about breaking into a habitation or a place of business or something like that, 
uh, deadly force can be can be used because mm -hmm. um, we're making the assumption that you're in fear of your life. Okay. Uh, and it does once once deadly force is employed, it doesn't matter what that deadly force is. It mm -hmm. can be a gun, it can be a knife, I can run you over the car, stick a pen in your eye, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the use of deadly force, the, the, the force doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. deadly force is going to be deadly. So, John, um, can I share yeah. my screen too? Uh, you should be able to. Go for it. All right. So, like, when you mentioned Castle Law, I just wanted, and this is a serious question here, right? Um, they they based this off a case, right? Like, this is based off a case? That I don't know. Okay. So, like, I'm, I'm thinking maybe if it was based off a case, it was probably based off of uh, off of the, the Frank Castle case, right? <laughs> Get out! <laughs> <laughs> Penalty shot, minus 100 points. I think, yeah, I was going to say, it's time for another shot. <laughs> <laughs> right, so for, for, those, for, those, uh, for those of you who don't know, who might, oh, wait, you, don't do, you, you only do videos, so everyone saw that. All right, cool. I don't have to explain it. I'm used to my show. Go ahead. Sorry. I'll just see myself out after that one. <laughs> so, Alex, uh, do we have any Frank Castle Punishers available in Japan? Or is there anything even remotely close to this in Japan? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because as far as I know, there are no castles in the United States, but there's actually <laughs> a lot of castles in Japan. Um, having said that, castle law is not really something that is is uh is something is defined in, in japan it's, it's, as i said before about the um you know what are the rules with regards to self-defense so first of all um you know the first thing was is there an illegal violation or trespass against you so in that case if somebody comes into your house mm -hmm. you know um yeah clearly Somebody who is there should not be there. That person is in violation of the law. If that person attacks you, then you have the right to uh, engage in self-defense. But, and as this is always the but, it must be a justifiable level of self-defense. So if somebody comes into your house, uh, just because they're in your house does not mean to say that you can grab the kitchen knife and stab them. And mm -hmm. kill them or injure them, mm -hmm. and because if you do that, then that that is excessive uh, self defense, and therefore it is not self defense. It is an aggravation. It is a, it is a crime against you. Uh -huh. so it's kind of it's very different to uh, uh, the the American mentality, I guess. If somebody is in your house, then you have the right to shoot their asses. Well, yeah. depending on the state, of course. Of course, yeah. Um, in Japan, it's like, well, you have the right to defend yourself from getting hurt. Obviously, you can't run away and avoid mm -hmm. the situation very easily. You're cornered mm -hmm. in your own house, and mm -hmm. the person should not be there. Um, you do what you can to protect yourself, but you cannot do anything more than that. Mm -hmm. and what they always recommend, like in when I was talking to a cop in California, he said if someone does break into your house and you decide to do engage, if you do decide to engage with them, like if you don't decide to get your family out the back door or if you're by yourself, you know, get out of the house and just call the cops that he recommended if you engage, you probably should just kill them because dead men tell no tales. That's actually always favorable uh, for, by, in America by the law standards that once a person's dead, well, at that point, now it's all in faith. It's, it's all in your favor in court at that point. Because they can just you look at whatever you tell them, and there's no witness to say otherwise. Right. Well, if the other person's alive, they can they can come up with stories, and you may actually end up losing in court, which right. is why it's probably better just to kill them. Hmm. You and should go free castle on their ass. <laughs> in America. In America. Yeah. Now, um, I want to ask you both your opinions on a couple cases that happened in Japan. We are all martial artists and we're all coaches. And of course, there's always this idea of how can you preach peace when you teach war, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We teach our students to be violent, basically, in certain situations. We're teaching them to hit each other. Um, there's a couple of stories in Japan. For those who are listening, you, this might be your first time hearing these stories. And as we're talking about castle law, this is all connected. 
Uh, number one, my first story. 2013, you guys might be familiar with this. Uh, in the Tokyo area, a young woman named Asaya Suzuki in 2013 is having ex-boyfriend stalker problems. This uh, ex-boyfriend is texting her and threatening her violently through email. She's 17 years old, by the way. She finally goes to the cops and basically they can't do anything. All they can do at this point, because the stalker laws is give him a stern talking to. So they call him up three times and he just never answers the phone. Uh, they want to visit him in person, but they don't have the most recent registered address. So they can't get a hold of him. This young lady comes home. She enters her home. She's on the phone for 20 minutes with the police. As soon as she hangs up, this ex-boyfriend jumps out of her closet and attacks her with a knife. So now we have knife situation and attacking in your own home, home invasion. He chases her out into the street where she collapses. He runs off. Later, he's arrested, which is good. She's taken to the hospital and bleeds out. She dies. Now, the reason I mention this is that, as we said before, Japan really is safe. But even here, these types of crimes happen, including attacks in your own home. And this leads us to the second story, knowing that this can happen. Just this year, in July, in Mia Prefecture, a woman comes home and finds an intruder in her home. As I mentioned before, people don't seem interested in these stories. I only found one article on this story and it was not very detailed. We don't know if this woman called the police or not. We know she called her boyfriend. And we know her boyfriend later said that well, we know that her and her boyfriend later said they don't know who this guy was. Whether or not she called the police, the boyfriend shows up first. He gets in between his girlfriend and the intruder and he pulls a knife. As Alex was talking earlier, we already know this is a bad idea for him by the Japanese law. He goes to town on the invader, cuts him up. Finally, the police arrive. We still don't know who called them or when. Uh, the intruder is taken to the hospital and he's in unstable condition. The boyfriend is arrested for attempted murder. Now, Alex has already explained how this works in Japan. And this is the point where a lot of my American friends are saying, what the hell? Why did he get arrested? But we need to realize this is not America. This is a different culture. There is no castle law here. Now, the both of you, I want to pose this question as martial artists, as coaches with students. What are your thoughts on these cases and what can you we tell our students about defending themselves in this kind of world well beyond my students i just had this conversation with my wife i told her one day if i end up in prison this is exactly how it's going to happen I, I was honest i'm like i will go to like and, th and this, this goes with, with what that one post that hackleman put up recently saying that you know I, i'll choose i'll choose prison over the morgue like mm -hmm. that's that's not a big deal. I, I'm be, to, yeah. yeah, the other way, better to be uh, uh, tried by twelve and carried by six. That's the other saying, right? So, like the way I look at it is, if someone's threatening my family or my daughter, they're gonna die, and I'll I'll, I'll do the time, and I'll accept it. whether it's fair or not. I'll be happy knowing that they're safe. Mm -hmm. That's that that to me is more of a consolation. Mm -hmm. So, and as far as my students are concerned, if it's the same kind of situation, I I would teach them the same thing. You know, if it's going to be a life or death situation, be prepared to pay the consequences. Be prepared to pay the consequences of what happens if you are in a serious situation. I'll try to be, no, don't be stupid and pull a knife on someone if you don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. If the person's unarmed and you can handle it unarmed. But still, always remember that when you're in Japan, this is what I tell my students all the time, that most likely you're going to have to pay for the confrontation. But going back to what I said earlier, that if you're in a confrontation where you feel your life is being threatened, then just get ready to pay the consequences of doing some time, but knowing that you knew that consciously when you went in. Don't come in hot-headed. Know that when you make that decision to fire, you most likely will do time and be okay with that. Covet number, covet, caveat, caveat. I fuck up this word all the time. English is my second language. Hey, you so, got my last name right last time. That's a good start. I'm getting there. Estoy tratando, I'm trying. So... The second thing I always say is this idea that 
you end up in a situation where you have to defend yourself. A lot of times is not, it's like a very one zero point zero 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 one percent chance. And that's all I'm always telling for that. Like even in America, like even statistically speaking, you still have a very, very, very low chance. This is something that we look as martial artists. We love to glorify the streets, the streets in the streets. We're always saying this, but in reality, um, even in America, the chances of it happening are very, 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 very low. So, like in Japan, there now we've grabbed that number and we've statistically lowered it some more. Right. So, like that, that's something I always try to tell my students. Like, hey, you po- most likely you won't have to deal with this. And a lot of this. Oh, and then one more clause I can add is your ch- when kids are involved. When kids are involved, it never escalates to that point. Like I told you the other day, someone a kid got stabbed at a school near near, near where I'm at. Right. That that didn't hit the news because mm-hmm. the cops weren't even called mm-hmm. because it was just like, hey, uh, can we sit all this between ourselves? It wasn't a, it wasn't like a mortal, you know. It was it was just a flesh wound, as they say in Monty Python. So like, so it wasn't it wasn't deadly, and it just got swept under the rug. So like, yeah. What I what I want to say is there is a big gray area of crime in Japan of things that happen that don't get reported and I'm in the middle of nowhere. So maybe in the city is different. I hear a lot of stuff that happens that doesn't get reported and people just settle it between themselves and we say, no, that's not because they do understand that Japanese law is so strict. If we can just settle this and say, no harm, no foul, then we can move forward. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually it's it's interesting you say that Angelo, because um, there's actually two sets of law in Japan. Uh, There's Keho and the Minpo. And uh, the care whore is when the police are involved. Minpo is between the people. <laughs> and so anything that involves uh, uh, sort of, um, what can I say, uh, people who are not legally adults yet. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, perhaps that's, that's, it was settled with the Minpo rather than the care whore. I don't know, but it's just interesting hearing what you say. It's sort of I've heard that a lot, yeah. 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 Um, John, is it all right if I share a screen again? Yeah, Matt? go for it. Go ahead. Okay, so it's kind of li- listening to this very interesting question, especially from a martial artist perspective. Tra- traditionally, from, from a martial artist perspective, um, we, can, we can look to uh, in, back in the history again, um, back to the, the Tokugawa period. Mm-hmm. The Toku- Tokugawa period started around about 1600 after the uh, Battle of Sekigahara. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be more precise, in, in 1603, when Tokugawa Ieyasu created the, the shogunate, the Tokugawa mm-hmm. shogunate. And that was the start of what was to become essentially over two and a half centuries of peace. Right. Japan. And this, you know, the, to put it in context, this is after, another, you know, um, a long time of incessant civil war and incredible right. violence in Japan, known as the Warring States period. Mm-hmm. So finally, Japan was unified. Uh, the, the Tokugawa shogunate was created. Uh, what the shogunate set out to do, pretty much straight from the from the well from the outset, was to somehow calm everybody down, put social mm-hmm. controls uh, in law, so that uh, the the prospect of any further war for, warfare could be avoided. Uh-huh. Uh, in fact, the last major uh, skirmish, if you like, in Tokugawa, Japan, until the end of it, when we had the Me- Meiji uh, um, Restoration uh-huh. in 1868 and, and the turbulent le- years before that, because of an American, uh, <laughs> the name of Matthew Sorry Perry, that. Sorry. came over and started causing trouble. Um, we won't apologize. I'm not apologizing <laughs> for nothing. I'm standing my ground on this one. <laughs> yeah. So the last one was in 1637, which was the Shimabara Rebellion. So, yeah. so it's after 1637, there was no real wars. <laughs> and so in any case, from, from the start of the Tokugawa period, the Tokugawa government was looking at controlling or curbing the violent tendencies <laughs> of a warrior culture that had already been in existence for centuries and based its uh, its concepts of honor and existence mm-hmm. on violence right uh-huh. so how do you tame a group of professional warriors and mm-hmm. many philosophies were were created this is really the the golden years of what bushido was all about you know mm-hmm. and, and like from warfare it's like how do we justify the existence of of samurai in the upper echelons of society right trained warriors professional warriors you know, their culture is based on extreme violence, kill or die right. uh, in the process. 
um, how do you how do you justify the existence of such a group of people in a time of peace? Right. And one of the really important philosophies, one of the really uh, influential philosophies that uh, came out of this period of of recalibration, if you yeah. like, of the warrior class, was um, was uh, in a book known as the Heho Kadensho, and it was written by a guy called Yagyu Munenori. Yagyu Munenori was, uh, he was the military advisor and Kenjutsu teacher to the shogun. He was a very influential man. I had this book, yes. Yeah, in the Heho Kadensho, he wrote about um, what were originally Zen philosophies of the Setsunin To Mm -hmm. and the Katsunin Ken. I've got here Katsujin Ken, but uh, that's what most people know it by, but it's actually cuts and in can. Okay. Um, in English, I would uh, translate it as the death dealing blade and the life giving sword. Mm-hmm. And this can be interpreted on many different levels from the basic martial artist mm-hmm. right the way up uh, to how you rule a country. Mm-hmm. And so this philosophy has many different levels. But basically, the way it goes is that um, a samurai's job is to know how to fight. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what they are. They're, they're professional warriors. So to know how to fight means to know how to use your sword, to know how to kill people. Mm-hmm. And killing, according to Yagyu Mune Nori, was a bad thing, actually. It goes against the way of heaven or Tendor. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is what we do, boys. Okay. Right. So um, how do we justify this in a time of peace? Well, the fact that we can kill, we can use our swords, uh, is the reason why we can maintain peace mm-hmm. in the first place. And so to, to quote from him, as it, as it says here, at times, because of one man's evil, 10,000 people suffer. So you kill that one man to let tens of thousands live. So mm-hmm. what, you're, what he's essentially saying is that, you know, you, you're trained in the martial arts. You're trained in, to, in how to, to kill somebody or maim somebody, injure them. Um, uh, and at times you'll need to do that because there is some bad bastard mm-hmm. who's, uh, who's causing trouble, breaking the law or making everybody's life miserable like some dictator or something like that, right? So you have to use your skill for the greater good. Mm -hmm. And if you use your skill for the greater good, then that actually contributes to a peaceful society. So Mm -hmm. so you think that's what that guy was thinking when he stabbed that socialist? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think so, yeah. He's probably right because he had a he had a political motivation for it, right? Yeah. And it, yeah, Do you think he right. chose Iwaki Zashi specifically for yeah. that reason? I mean, like, honestly, I, I had this feeling that, especially as a Japanese nationalist, he would use a Japanese traditional blade specifically to get his message across. Well, you could argue that that's what the Japanese uh, high command was thinking when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you could you could say that that's. Uh, what uh, the Americans were thinking when they bombed Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Right. I mean, of course, uh, a really easy to understand example of this is um, Bush and his foray into Iraq to mm-hmm. kill Saddam Hussein. Right. It's perfect, isn't it? Kill one man's evil so everybody can live in peace. It's misguided, obviously, but okay. it has a very long uh, history, history of, yeah, of, moving to, uh, of of uh, justifying the use of violence for the greater good. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, uh, it, it is very flawed philosophy. But if it stops there, it's very flawed. If mm-hmm. you take it the next level, okay, um, that is to be able to use your uh, authority and mm-hmm. your power to achieve peace without violence. Right. And so th- there, is a, there is a level there. First of all, you must learn how to use violence to protect yourself and to protect the people around you. And if that involves you actually very seriously hurting somebody or killing somebody, mm-hmm. if it's for the greater good, then it is justified, at least in your mind, at least in your, in your, uh, you know, in your, in your, in the context of where you are and what you're doing. Right. 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 Um, but ultimately, this philosophy. What trumps the sets ninto, the death dealing blade, is the life giving sword. And that, and this is where it's, it's really kind of interesting in Japan. 
I don't think the people who made the laws were specifically thinking about this, but there is definitely a tradition that exists in Japan mm-hmm. and that uh, if you can defeat or, or, or hold somebody just enough without killing them, then this is the ultimate. Right. So somebody in, uh, breaks into your house and attacks your girlfriend uh, or attacks you with a knife or a weapon uh, or with their bare hands or whatever it is, all that you can do if you are trained in the martial arts and you're very skilled in the martial arts, hopefully you're skilled enough for your own sake, legally speaking, uh, to be able to subdue that person without going into excess. Right. Controlling it then. It's very difficult, though, when you have the adrenaline pumping. But the yeah, ideal... absolutely. And that is precisely the point of training mm-hmm. where somebody who can kick somebody's ass you know, because they're well-trained in kicking people's ass is, okay, that's one thing. But in terms of the overall philosophy of the setsuninto and katsuninkan, Mm -hmm. um, is actually at the very lowest level. Mm -hmm. So aspiring to the highest level, I've actually been able to defeat somebody uh, just enough Mm -hmm. without an excess. Is something that's actually been around uh, at least as a philosophy and as an ideal going um, with what you're saying right now it makes sense that that's kind of in the culture because i do i do remember of a case where a friend of mine was assaulted and my friend my the friend of mine he's chinese canadian and he spent some time in china and studied uh, a type of wind chun so he knew how to strike but he didn't know how to grapple and when, when the when the Japanese guy who was drunk came at them, this was in Japan. Japan. Yeah, in Japan. This is in Japan. He was hesitant to strike him because he knew how, how the laws were. And the other two guys knew how to grapple. Um, well, one of them, one of them has done like several different types of styles from from Krav Maga to Judo, and and then the other guy was just big. They're both big guys, so they pretty much just hugged him, <laughs> like. They grabbed him. They didn't tackle him. They just grabbed him. Two big guys grabbed him. He couldn't move. He was yelling. And then uh, the, the Canadian guy called the cops, and they, they just held on to him. And the cops got there, and they're like, what's going on? We're holding this guy because he attacked our friend. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. And yeah, yeah they're, and they're just holding him, right? They're just holding him. <laughs> they're just holding him. Like, the way he described it, like, two giant guys hugging a small guy. <laughs> He's like, let me go, let me go, right? So, like, and the cops were just pretty much, oh yeah, he's drunk, and you know, yeah. we're, we're, no, gonna put it, we're gonna put him, we're gonna put it. You know, do you, do you want to press charges? No. Are you okay? Oh, I just want them to let me go. All right. That's the ideal resolution. Of course, yeah. more of attacking you with a weapon and they're hell bent on uh, killing you, hurting you, or or somebody, your ch- your child, or something like that. You, you of course, you're going to go nuts, but. You know, uh, you, you can't, you know, I mean, what I'm talking about is the ideal situation. Right, right, right. And, and Because let's face it, the law is not always fair. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, the law is never perfect. Right, going, right. Going back to the statistics I talked about earlier, like the chances, what are the chances you'll end up in that situation? Not that high. Now, a drunk guy coming up to you being stupid, the chances of that happening are much higher. Hmm. Still very low on the totem pole of probability, but most likely if you are a foreigner in Japan and you go out for drinking, that is mo- that is a there's a very high, there, you have a higher chance of that happening in that kind of situation. Yeah. And in that kind of situation even then um I describe that situation happened. And then I'll add that to the other story of another guy that lost his shit and I don't want to go into it because it's like a whole, it'll take a minute just to try to give the context. So I'm just going to give you the, the footnote. Um, he lost his shit. He was high on spice. He uh, quit working for the company that I worked at. I told John this story because it's, it's, it's one of the bits that I worked on for stand up for a while. Um, but either way, long story short, he ran out of the building, punched a car, made a dent, broke a window and then the cops put him in prison. And then when they put him in prison, they were like, confess. No, I didn't do anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't do anything. You got the wrong guy. 
we got three people saying, you know, I didn't do anything, I didn't do it. And this goes back to the Japanese law that like 98% of their things are done through confession. So yeah. if you if you adamantly sit there in the in the in the hold box, and then he started saying, I want to talk to the person I that's uh, accusing me of assault. I want to talk to them. I want to talk to them. No, I didn't do it, but I want to talk to this person accusing me. You have to tell me of the person accusing me. And it was only one person because he broke a window of the lady's car. So the right. lady, they finally agreed. Fine, we'll let you talk to her if you confess. He's all, I'm not going to confess to anything, but if you let me talk to her, I'll think about it. So finally, they let her in, and when they let him in, he said, you're accusing me, it wasn't me, and she's like, it was you, it was you. It's like, I don't know who it was, but I'll pay for the damages. <laughs> this is this is very smooth and very Japanese. Right there. <laughs> what do you deal with that? I don't know who it was, and it was him. I mean, <laughs> he, was he was hot. Here. He was high on spice. This is the yeah. beginning of the story, but they didn't know that. We all knew that, and uh, yeah, they. She said, "Okay, if you pay for the damages, I don't care. Fine." And then it got up. And so, yeah, according to the cops, he never admitted to it, so he never confessed. They couldn't put him in prison. Yes. They, they got, he, you know, they they settled it out. He paid for the damages and didn't even lose his visa. And the cops give him a stern warning. If we catch you even one more time, you are so deported. But it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. There's, uh, there's so much you can read into that. Um, one, generally speaking, the cops don't want to be bothered with foreigners if they can, because there's too much bullshit with the language. <laughs> okay. And yeah. dealing with belligerent foreigners is, you know, it's like not high on the list of, of uh, you know, um, of priorities, if, if at all possible. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, you're, you're right, Angela, when, when, when it's, you know, as a foreigner you go out drinking, you stand out. If you do get into a confrontation of some sort, maybe it's another drunk coming up and giving you shit. Um, generally, we're pretty intolerant bunch as well because we can't be bothered with the bullshit because we live in Japan and we're sick of all the crap. Okay. And we... we <laughs> Well, when I say we, I'm talking about me. No, that, that, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll throw myself in. We, 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 uh. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, right? you, know. you know there's the thing called the rage, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rage. Some days you just cannot be asked with any of this. Okay, and it shows in your face, and you, you know, and, and, and things escalate when they don't need to. Right. And especially when alcohol is involved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, we there as a foreigner in Japan, you get certain you get a certain bit of uh, a little little bit of leeway. But on the other hand, when they throw the book at you, watch out, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you're screwed. So again, just chilling out, chilling out and just avoiding this kind of shit if at all possible. If you're on the spice, okay, <laughs> it's gonna make it a lot more difficult for you to chill out and, and avoid it. <laughs> Well, he, no, this guy was not avoiding it. <laughs> he was going after it. Well, I just, <laughs> your advice for any martial artist who comes to Japan, just chill out, don't take spice. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't shouldn't take really spice, talk, about, I shouldn't talk about this, but actually a few, um, about a year ago, I was walking home uh, down one of the narrow streets where I live, and this, this guy in a car screams past me, clips me in the elbow with his, with his mirror on his car, and then he stops and he's obviously drunk driving. He gets out and we have a go at each other, right? And I'm thinking, shit, I've got a television job next week. I don't want to be in the newspapers uh, for a foreigner getting into a, you know, a, a fight with a, with a drunk. And uh, so I, I just grabbed onto him and, you know, and ended up on the ground. He was on top of me. Um, and it's like, God, I want to, I really want to hit you. I really want to hit you. Um, but no, I won't. I'll just take it. Anyway, cops come, right? Because, you know, everybody is watching from their houses. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the cops come and they see a foreigner and they see this guy who's absolutely going berserk about this bloody foreigner. He'd, he'd actually, in the, somehow, he in the time, he'd hidden his car because he didn't want to be found out that he was drinking and driving. But, and um, to be honest, I was a little bit drunk at the time as well, so I don't remember bits of this. But what happened? Thank God. <laughs> as soon as the cops turn up, what did he do? He belted a cop. <laughs> <laughs> the cop! <laughs> I think at that point you were clear to go. 
<laughs> and the, you, I, I couldn't believe it. I was just standing there talking to the cops saying, well, you know, I was just, I was on my way home and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, this guy just belts the cop <laughs> in front of all these other cops. And they just looked at each other going, bloody hell. <laughs> yeah, you should have seen the cops. They just, just went like, at the, at the time they were looking at me like, yeah, you're a foreigner. You're, you're, you something you're... fishy going on here. <laughs> this doesn't smell right. He blew this his cover. Right. As soon as this guy belts the cop, it's like, oh, phew, off the hook. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so they said, well, we'll take you home, sir. They escorted me home. Said, okay? Then they got nice. Okay? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You want to press charges? And I said, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I, I don't want anything to do with this. All right. <laughs> Nothing. Are you sure you don't want to press? No, I don't want to do anything. <laughs> Anyway, this is the best way to do it. He got carted away. And and so I got away (laughs) with it, with all the bullshit that, uh, you know, being involved in something is not good at the best of times. Yeah. And it would have taken me, you know, best part of a night to try and explain all this away and talk reason, you know, get it sorted out. And then eventually it would have gone away. But, you know, you just don't want to get involved, man. It's just so much easier. Even if you do, if it falls on you like, you know, crock of crap from, from, from the skies, you know, somehow avoid it. It's just not worth it. It And this is good advice. This whole show, this whole point of this, anybody who trains in martial arts, learns how to fight, you come to Japan for a week or for years, this is all good advice for you guys. Now we're about to take our last shot and our final question. So if you guys are ready, you can pour up. Now, anybody who knows this show knows our final question is not meant to be taken seriously. It's a, Kind of a joke question. If you uh, bring my first it, if you one bring, based on yeah, Batman I, I, and Superman. Yeah, I, I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't uh, ruin your your question. In it and you, no, 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 no. You, you lighten the mood enough that we can go on from people being murdered to uh, something much less serious. I was going to ask you to throw in a random joke, and that was much better. So, <laughs> our final question for the night, as we talk about the law and self defense and all, your opinion. What is the best cop movie or cop TV show? I'm going to say Dragnet. Not the Dan Aykroyd, Tom Hanks movie, but the original black and white TV show. I loved it as a kid, and I think it it, uh, impacted detective cop shows, movies, et cetera, et cetera. I was going to say Tango and Cash, if you guys know that movie. But I'm saying Dragnet is the best. What is your call? The best cop movie or TV show? All right. Um, I, I watch a lot of them, actually, uh, what's available on Netflix. But the one that's always, I don't know why, maybe it's nostalgia mm-hmm. um, from the days when there were only two TV channels in New Zealand. Um, have you guys ever heard of the Hill Street Blues? The name, but I don't I know the, what it is. I heard the name. Hill Street Blues. It's an American cop series. Um, from memory and a little bit hazy because I was only a kid. Yeah. Um, it, I think it was, it was either, well, it's either LA or New York, right? So okay. I mean, it's either okay. one of those two. That's that's America, LA and New York. That's all we have. <laughs> and um, and I think the catchphrase at the end, the, the sergeant, it'd always be giving the uh, the troopers a uh, you know a speech in the morning about what they got uh, you know on in the day, and he'll always say to them before they go off. Uh, out in their cars um, to catch all the crooks is like let's be safe out there and it's like it's always been in my head yeah, so nice. whether it's the best I cannot say but it's the one that's that's always been with me that's nice that's nice I agree with that you, you hey. said you you include movies and I think this is your yeah. biggest mistake in this question uh oh because it's almost the holidays and there's one cop movie that is the best cop movie I've ever fucking seen yippee motherfucker die hard, die hard. It's, <laughs> he's a cop all right he is a cop, a cop. he is it's a cop movie people forget is. that he is a detective he, he's you know he was it was his day off and he didn't sign up for this shit i think he says that a few times but by Go far close, have a few laughs yeah. yeah yeah by far the best cop movie ever in my opinion is die hard and the whole fucking series i love it and I got to watch the whole damn thing because it's Christmas soon. And that's an American. Tradition. Now I'm uh, now I'm thinking about that, too. We, we, last year, we uh, watched a movie for, for the holidays and we might make Die Hard this year. Now, now that, that is still maybe my favorite Christmas movie. And that is still a debate. But yeah, it's a Christmas movie. Yeah, it is. It is. Now, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you guys living in Japan. Are you familiar with the show Seibu Keisatsu? Seibu Keisatsu. This is 
I don't watch Japanese shit on TV. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I got Netflix for, man? <laughs> well, I watched it on Netflix. Just gonna say that, like I said, this is uh, this is maybe from the early '80s. It is the worst goddamn cop show I've ever seen. But I loved it. it was, I only watched two episodes and it was just a Japanese TV show with, you know, cops running around with the guns in the air like this and trying to look tough. Anybody who's interested in the dark side of Japanese pop culture, you can go to the 80s and watch shows like this. But that's the end of our show. So we're going to finish off right about here. Uh, it's been a great conversation. First off, thank you for everyone for tuning in and watching. A special shout out to Grandmaster Case. Thank you for giving us your knowledge and your expertise and helping us to talk about this again. If you're interested more in the American self-defense laws, check out the bonus episode I will be posting soon. Angelo, thank you for tuning in and being our my, my awesome co-host always. Uh, he's coming from his show, The Social Jello with Angelo Show, which recently passed 100 episodes. So special applaud for him. The 102nd episode had uh, legend John Hackleman, our, our local friend, Rob Rowland, and my instructor, Ronna Steller, uh, had an awesome conversation. I also want you to check out the 100th episode. You can hear the question that started a Kaiju Kimball war on Facebook. And you can hear Angelo call me a prostitute. Alex, thank you. I did not in. call a Alex prostitute. Later. <laughs> Alex he called himself a prostitute. His prostitute. <laughs> uh, Alex, by the way, I mentioned not only as a martial artist that you are a writer. Are you working on any projects right now? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, well, let me uh, see. Uh, you've all heard of Miyamoto Masashi, right? Of course, he's my hero. Yeah, right. And there was a, a famous novelist called Yoshikawa Eiji mm -hmm. who wrote. <laughs> a, a, a massive bloody novel on him yeah um great and, novel uh, i did read it. that that was one of my inspirations to come to japan yeah, yeah mine too mine oh, too okay. but it's published by kordansha uh-huh right um there's another well-known publishing company in the world dealing with uh things japanese called tuttle okay Tuttle wants their own translation of this monster. So Are you I'm, doing it? I'm working on this. And another book I'm working on, which you guys, you guys might be interested in, um, uh, coming from the Taiju Society of Things. Uh, where the hell is it? I'm serious. Oh, this one here. Beyond Taiju. There's a book uh, written by a former K1 uh, shimpan or referee. Uh -huh. Umpire, uh -huh. right? K1 being the professional kickboxing and stuff. It's about the history of the word os. Oh, this is a big topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've just about finished the translation of this book now. It's going to be published with Tuttle eventually. It's really bloody interesting. I'm curious. This is what I'm checking out. I am uh, very because this is a whole topic of discussion on the internet. Well, there you and, go. And then one thing I just I do want to mention to Alex is even though it seems on the surface that some Kaju Kimbo guys are focused on Taijutsu. Um, we do, a lot of us do a lot of weapons. So it, it might not be formally recognized as Kendo or Bushido, but a lot of us do do a lot of weapons, like, um, you know, classic bow staff, sword, and that kind of stuff too. And yeah, that, that is part of Kaiju Kimbo. You know, it's not. A, it's not as practical. It's not as practical. <laughs> um, but it is fun. And 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 we and and I know a lot of the schools that like to do um, stuff with uh, bamboo swords and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it's not. It's not, it's you not study what formal. you want to study. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not as formal <laughs> as Kendo, but now, yeah. Alex, real quick, uh, your books are available on Kindle. Uh, most of them are on Kindle. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So that, that's a big thing for me as well. Uh, be sure to check out, is it under Alex Bennett? Do you have like a pseudonym or anything? No, no, no. It's Alex or Alexander. Alexander, Alexander Bennett. Alex Bennett. Yes. Be, sure to, be sure to check that out. He's got some great stuff. Finally, thank you those of you tuning in to watch our show. Please click like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, if you know somebody who's interested in the martial arts or self-defense or legal things, please share this video with them. I'm not really a big podcaster. This is seriously like my seventh video, maybe in like three, four years. Uh, but also if you are a law professional, if you are an LEO, I would love for you guys to comment on this video and check out the, the bonus podcast and comment on that as well. I would love to hear what other police officers, law enforcement professionals have to say about what we've talked about and your own experiences. And like we mentioned, it will change from state to state. And I would love to hear what you got to say. Other than that, this 
is the end of our show. This has been Four Shots of Kaiju Kembo. I've been your host, John Hoylo. Thank you for joining in. Until next time, stay strong, stay Kaiju Kembo strong. Mahalo. Mahalo.